Good afternoon. Welcome to the Red Deer Museum and Art Gallery for our mini tour from the Prairie Vernacular on Indigenous Perspectives. I'm Lynn LaCour, the Education Coordinator, and I am going to be doing this tour with Marissa Mitsuing. I'll introduce her in a moment. But first, I'd like to start off with some land acknowledgements. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Red Deer Museum and Art Gallery recognizes that this land in which we live is in convergence with Treaty 6 north of the Red Deer River, uh, representing the Niwak, Cree, Sotu, and Dene people, and Treaty 7 south of the Red Deer River, representing the Blackfoot, Tsitsuna, Kainai, and Stony Nakoda peoples, as well as the Métis peoples. We strive in the spirit of treaties to keep this place of trust, friendship, and promise. We acknowledge that promise and we invite you to share in our respect for our future together and to move forward in a good way. Now, the Prairie Vernacular has many sub-themes, but one of them is the Indigenous pr Perspectives. And I'm here with Marissa Mitsuing, who is the former co-curator of the uh, Uchu and Powo, the Origins uh, exhibition. And we are going to be partnering through this uh, little mini tour to look at and talk about eight Indigenous artists that are in this exhibit. And so we can talk about both our perspectives. So you can introduce yourself, Marissa. Awesome. Thank you so much, Beth. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying uh, this is um, a partnership that I appreciate so much um, and the way that the museum amplifies Indigenous voices is so important and imperative and I'm just so thankful for uh, the team here. So um, let's get started. Okay. First of all, we will start with this artist, Betty Spence. So we are going to take a tour uh, around the galleries and we're going to be looking at Indigenous artists that uh, talk about, uh, share their land because one thing that they all have in common is their kinship with the land. Mm -hmm. The land is an important part of Indigenous culture and tradition and we're going to look at how all of these artists portray it. So Betty Spence is um, an elder and she's Cree from um, the Red River First Nation, Saskatchewan. This painting, however, is of the Yukon River. Now, Betty, as a trained artist, some of the artists in this exhibition are trained and some of them are self-taught. Betty is trained and she has a fine arts degree. Uh, she is honoring the land and mother nature. She always wants to represent the land and all the changes that have happened in the land over time. Now, she is an elder who wants to keep up with the traditions of uh, the surviving traditions of the First Nations people. And when I look at this landscape, you see this lovely landscape where um, she has really captured the essence of things going off into the distance and that sense of space with lots of rich textures of the forest in the, in the foreground and reflections in the hill. She's done a lovely job of capturing how she wants to honor Mother Nature. Uh, when I looked at this to see, well, how has the landscape changed? It's really quite subtle, but you'll notice in the foreground Around, there is a road intersecting through the landscape and there's another one right in the very fore foreground. So this is how the landscape has changed for the First Nations people over the years. It might be subtle, but man has made his mark with um, emphasizing transportation. And I find it's interesting that why is it that the roads are in the foreground and nature is in the background? That might be a statement that she could be making as well. And what do you have Absolutely. to add? Absolutely. Um, when I was doing some research on Betty, I came a lot. <clears throat> I came across a lot of accounts of her kindness, and a lot of the things that she painted: um, the water, nippy, the warmth in the back from the sun, the rock. There's so many different teachings in there that are intertwined with that, with with kindness, and it really does capture the essence in here. Okay. Well, we're going to move on and talk about another favorite artist of both of ours, Alan Sapp. So follow us this way. Now, this part of the section of the Prairie Vernacular is on memory. And Alan Sapp, his two works here are really uh, very indicative of memory. Now, Alan Sapp is Plains Cree from the... Um, Red Pheasant Cree Nation in North Battleford, Saskatchewan. And um, he paints on his traditional uh, 
upbringing and he paints from memory. And Marissa will speak on some of those um, traditions in a few moments, but I just wanted to compare Alan Sapp's style of his painting compared to Betty Spence. Betty Spence is a trained artist and Alan Sapp is a self-taught artist. When he was a child, he was encouraged by his kokum, his grandma, to continue painting and drawing because she saw a lot of talent there. But he didn't have any way to learn from, um, learn how to be a better artist. So he studied Western art, which at that time was a lot of calendar art. So he kind of became a calendar artist and then he started going door to door to uh, sell his artwork. He then met a doctor named Dr. Alan Goner, who really encouraged him to paint what he knew. And what he knew was his traditional lifestyle. So as soon as he started to paint from memories of his traditional lifestyle, that is when his art career took off. And he is now a nationally recognized artist and has artworks all across collections in Canada. So that is quite significant. And what I find is interesting between Alan's work and Betty's work is they both capture the land, the colors of the land, what we call local color or nature, natural color, and you really see there's a bit more of a subdued coloring, but this is definitely uh, a painting of the fall landscape. You can see the fall colors. And over here, you definitely get that feeling and that sense of winter. He knows how to capture the, um, the seasons. And he has this beautiful, rich texture. Both Betty Spence and Alan Sapp seem to know how to uh, uh, paint the texture of the land. But what I find, which is really charming about Alan Sapp's work, is he's got this beautiful, rich brush stroke that um, maybe we can zoom in on, and he really captures that. He's got a really good handling of space and proportion and perspective in all of his works. So um, even though he's self-taught, he is just as talented as Betty Spence. And I'm going to pass it over to Marissa, and she can speak on some of his traditions, that, uh, traditional way of life that he grew up. Absolutely. So his traditional name is Sapunam Giskitam, and it means he perceives it. So he never learned how to read or write, and painting was um, was sort of like an, a healing outlet for him. Um, I want to make note that uh, Alan Sap is an Indian residential school survivor, and this was one of those tools that he used um, to in in his healing process. Um, prior to European immigrants, um, indigenous communities, they govern themselves on a matriarchal system. And that is the, you can see here, you know, how he captures his cookum and the times with her and all the things that her cookum, I mean, his cookum taught him and his mushroom taught him and the, 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 the way that life was. And I, when I look at his paintings, I always wish that I could go into the mind of, of the women that, that are in these paintings, just to capture some of that knowledge and, and just to sit with them. One of the things um, that I love about him uh, was that um, when he would start to paint the things, um, that meant something to him. Like this is his childhood and his upbringing. He, he went back to his roots. He grew his hair out again and he wore beadwork and he, he tied his braids with uh, deer hide. And that's how I always see him. Um, I grew up in the community that he's from, North Battleford and um, some of uh, my ancestors, my lineage goes back to Red Pheasant, the same reserve that he's from. And I just, I love that art is, is a universal love language and that that is healing as well. And he went through so much. He had so much loss early in his life. Um, his mom died from TB and a lot of his siblings did. And that's where uh, his grandparents come in. And um, I was looking at some of his art and online to see what the, they go for. And the cheapest one that I saw was... $17,000. I think that's interesting that you, uh, you mentioned that. And um, when Dr. Alan Goner had told him, paint from what you know, 
I think that is a, a great message for all artists because when you paint from what you know, you come from a place of integrity and authenticity. And when I look at Alan Sapp's work, there is such integrity in what he's doing. And it's amazing the detail that he captures from memory. Absolutely. Some of his uh, most notable awards are um, an honorary doctorate degree from the University of Regina, the National Aboriginal Achievement Award, he's an appointed officer of the Order of Canada, and an elected royal for the Canadian Academy of Arts. And those are just a couple of, of the major awards that he's received. Um, Alan uh, passed away uh, in 2015, but he is still a very um, respected and admired figure in my community. And we were so thankful to um, have him come into our class when we were in elementary. So he is one of my all time favorites. Okay, and we are gonna travel over to the next part of uh, the exhibit when we're gonna talk about uh, memory and memoria. So we're gonna look at two artists there that are painting a much more historical perspective. And um, it'll be an interesting comparison of both of those, those paintings. So over here, the first one, we have Percy Two Gun Plains Woman. He's Kainai from the Kainai Reserve. He has um, painted what's called the last buffalo hunt. And um, as you probably know, the buffalo and bison are a very important uh, um, staple in uh, First Nations livelihood. It was uh, a point of their survival. Uh, now he is a trained artist. He became an artist at the age of 50 and learned from the Banff School of Fine Arts. He also is a residential school survivor. He went to residential school to grade seven. He ended up becoming a Bronco uh, buster. He was, worked in the rodeo. I'm not a rodeo person, so I'm not sure if that's the correct term, but he also went to war. And after war, when he was a POW, he um, started painting as a way of healing. And I think Marissa mentioned that earlier, that uh, art has been a source of healing for many of these artists. and. Uh, because it's something that's very reflective and it's also something that helps you to just, um, uh, it, it's, it's just so all-encompassing and, and healing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now his painting, which is very different from Alan Sapp's and Betty Spence, you'll notice his colors are more rich and vibrant. He's almost painting the landscape in, in a romantic way with these lovely pastorals. You see some purples and oranges. And so he's using much more rich color, which is different from what Betty and Alan used. Um, so he, he too is obviously having a reverence for the land. There's something almost romantic about this painting. And I think his background being in the rodeo, he has really captured uh, the movement of the bison running through the, the hunt and uh, the people on the horses. You can see the beautiful uh, musculature and yeah. the movement of the horses and the bison. Like he knows these animals, how they move. And there's just so much energy in this painting, so much movement. And that's what really, you know, your eye flows right throughout the entire painting. It's just lovely. I also want to point out here, he signs his name in the bottom corner, two gun, and he always paints two rifles. So that's his signature. And maybe Marissa, you can talk to us about how First Nations people got his, get their names. He got his name from his uncle who was Chief Eagle Child. Mm -hmm. So traditionally, uh, you would be named by uh, older men or women in your community and you'd have a single name, uh, it, and we didn't have a last name. So um, in my own family, uh, the, uh, when those, when that, when that came into effect, my, uh, the English translation for my grandfather is, uh, he sings alone, that's the name, but the translation uh, that they gave us in English is Lone Singer. So, the men in my family, their last name is Lone Singer. And uh, that's, yeah, that's how that changed. You would traditionally, people only had uh, just the, the one name. And sometimes eventually as you go on in life, you'd get another one uh, or it would change. Um, 
but we never had a first name or a middle name and a last name. So I love that uh, it, these names like two guns and uh, sap, like taking from, from really neat things. I think we'll uh, compare it to Henry Baudry's painting right beside it. Mm -hmm. Another um, interesting contrast. So this is also uh, a painting uh, on Treaty 6. So it's obviously a painting of a historical event, not from memory, but uh, probably from oral traditions. So Henry Baudry is Plains Cree, and he's from Poundmaker First Nation. He is the great grandson of Chief Poundmaker. So now in the signing of Treaty 6, um, Chief Poundmaker was one of the chiefs that signed the treaty document. And so I'm not sure if this is representing uh, Chief Poundmaker here, but it is his grandson, so I'm assuming that it, it probably is. Um, but in this in this uh, painting, it's uh, representative of all the people that would probably be there in the signing. You would have had a government official. I'm not sure if this is representing David Laird. Um, you would have a Northwest Mounted Police as uh, escorts. You would most likely have some kind of clergyman. And there was usually an interpreter. So I'm not sure if the second person in the background, the second Cree, is also uh, was the interpreter. Now, I look at this, and, and it's an interesting contrast from the one that we just looked at at Percy uh, Two Guns of the last buffalo hunt. It was a memory of uh, an experience that was harmonious. It was life-sustaining, that uh, the bison hunt. And here we have the signing of Treaty 6. And when you look at the colors, it's very jarring in comparison. You have this romantic colors in one painting, and you have this really bold, flat, dark, somber uh, blue-gray color in the background of this. All the figures here are very serious. Um, even this figure right here, he looks a little bit grumpy, uh, almost impatient, and uh, it's a completely different mood. I, I'm i also kind of struck by the colors, the color orange tablecloth. Now, in painting, blue and orange are complementary colors, Although I kind of am wondering if that orange is representing um, the, the symbolism and metaphor of Orange Shirt Day today. Now, of course, in 1876, they could not even know or comprehend in what exactly they were signing and how uh, the fallout of the treaties and the residential school system. But you, d you c will notice that he's also signing with an X. They didn't have a signature. They didn't write in the past. Everything was oral traditions. And I am going to pass it over to Marissa. I want her to speak on that. And I also noticed that everything about this painting seems off balance. There's four European, um, four Europeans in this painting and two Cree. And already this is setting up a stage of imbalance. Absolutely. Um, I am good friends with uh, Henry Baudry's granddaughter, and some of her art is hanging in my house. It's the first thing that I see when I wake up and, and the last thing I see when I go to bed. Um, so you can tell that the love of art has trickled into, into the next generation, so that's such a beautiful thing. Um, when I approached uh, her to tell, talk about um, uh, her grandfather today, let her know that I was gonna be here, uh, and I asked her if she wanted me to say anything, and I'm going to read what she said. Being the great-great-grandchild of Chief Palmaker, my mushroom, great-great-grandson of Chief Palmaker, my mushroom was proud and found it important to tell his version of the story of the treaty signing and the important role that Chief Palmaker played as an interpreter. For my mushroom, his roots were an important part of his life. Those beliefs and cultural traditions is what carried him through residential schools and through his time in the war being a POW. This is what got him through his hardships and made him that great man that he was. He also believed the treaties were unfair because our leaders had so much trust and they env envisioned a better life for the nations where we all shared the wealth. They never imagined the cultural genocide and the undue hardships that the treaties created. The systemic oppressions and abuses our people endured through residential schools and government policy was not something that our leaders envisioned when they signed the treaties. On behalf of the Baudry family, with 
every painting my grandfather painted, there was always a story. Growing up, he loved to share and show his work and tell us stories. His artwork was a way of escaping his memories of residential school and World War II. At the age of 96, he still suffered from PTSD, but his paintings are what got him through it. He lost himself in his artwork and it was truly magical to watch. He is dearly missed, but his legacy lives on through his grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Uh, I, I, I feel that pain alongside him, um, that this is so unfair, um, even, even today and, um, everything that she said, um, how, how, uh, the, the undue hardships and the cultural genocide, that those are things that are still happening. And we're all realizing that this is not how it was supposed to be. And I'm so thankful that those moments are caught here. Um, he was closer to um, like his parents and his grandparents and how that connection that he still had those, those He was able to um, speak the language and connect with his elders. And that's something that my generation um, is just reclaiming. And I'm so glad that he was able to capture that through his artwork and that we were able to look at it and be inspired um, to, to do more and um, to really correct um, how these treaties were supposed to happen. So I'm so, so thankful for artists like Henry. Yes, that was a, a, a beautiful uh, story that your, your friend's daughter wrote. Um, I remember the first time we looked at this, Marissa, and you had made a really important comment. And I had said, oh, I, it, this feels off balance. And you said, yes, and there's no women in it. Mm -hmm. And of course, in 1876, even for European settlers, women didn't have any rights. So what can you speak of on the rights of uh, self-government in, um, in the Cree? Uh, culture in the Cree nations and only indigenous um, yeah, peoples. Absolutely. Um, so we had always governed ourselves from a matriarchal system. And in the signing of the treaties, our men would go out when they, they would go and smoke the pipe and they would talk to the women and say, okay, what happened? Okay, then go back with this. And uh, the European settlers, they didn't want to deal with any women. So our, the, our men had to go and, and be the voice for us. And um, they, they smoke the pipe often because that pipe is a promise that supersedes this lifetime. It goes into the next and the next. So these promises and, and the trust that we put here wasn't just from these men signing, it was from the women, really from the women in our community. So um, thank you for being that up again. Okay. And the one thing that I always find beautiful about um, the uh, First Nations consensus is that everything happens in a circle. Mm -hmm. And in a circle, nobody is more important than anyone else. And I think that is really a, a beautiful thing and I think we need to consider that. So we are going to move on to much more contemporary artists. We're going to now look at Adrian Stimson. He is um, Siksika from the Siksika Reserve. He has grown up in Saskatchewan but studied in um, studied fine arts at the Alberta College of Art and Design, now known as the University of Arts of Alberta. And his paintings of the bison are drastically different than the former painting we looked at from Percy Two, Two Women, is that his that was a painting of abundance in bison, and this is paintings of scarcity. So this one painting, you see the lone bison, it's almost like a portrait, and he almost has this lonely expression on his face. And in the other painting, we have uh, clearly a scarce, scarcity of bison. So this is a more modern day um, uh, effects of what had happened with uh, the decimation of the bison. So at one point, 
in North America, it's been estimated that 75 million bison roamed the plains in North America, and uh, they have all most been decimated and this has had devastating effects to the First Nations people as a main source of their livelihood. But even in this painting that's starkly black and white, it's really sh sort of emphasizing the starkness of that reality. And uh, But the bison, as tiny as they are and as few as they are, they still have this incredible prominence on the land just to show how important they really are to the First Nations people. Now, Adrian Stimson had an incredible uh, metaphorical way of painting. He would say he wanted to rebuild the herd. So every time Adrian paints a bison, draws a bison, sculpts a bison, or gets students or other artists uh, to make bisons, he is rebuilding the herd one bison at a time. And I find that such a beautiful metaphor of him working. And the fact that he's um, also painted this black and white. I was trying to look up the symbolism of white and white in our cultures. It kind of means um, innocence and purity, but it also has a, a meaning of a fresh start. And I think he's also trying to say that here we are starting over again, rebuilding the herd. Hmm. In my culture, it, be, uh, it represents like um, air, cedar, but there's a prophecy uh, to the Cree people that um, everything is going to change when the white buffalo comes back. And I love the, the contrast here. It's black and white and different shades of all that in between. Um, when my people would, would hunt the buffalo, that was kind of like our Walmart. Um, it had everything that we needed. The, the animal had every single thing that we needed. Uh, it helped with the teepee, sleeping, the... Uh, the, the buffalo robes were also given as um, as an honor, given over your shoulders. That was uh, an honor to, to have a buffalo robe placed on your shoulders. Um, I love the idea that, uh, the same thing Lynn said, that that he's bringing them back through, through his artwork. Uh, one of uh, my friend's tribes, and you kind of notice all the, the stuff in the bank, we're not sure if that's snow or fog, but fog, um, in the fog, you're, you're not supposed to yell or be too loud because our holy people are planting offerings to Mother Earth in that time. Or maybe you know the bird said something like that. These are still here. I, I think these paintings are just, um, uh, I love them. They're just a beautiful uh, contrast. They show the, the prominence, the importance of the bison today as in the past, and I just think they're a lovely contrast to the painting before of the last bison hunt uh, by Percy uh, Two Guns Plains woman, and seeing the abundance there and seeing the scarcity yes, here yeah. says a lot of what has happened uh, since the signing of the treaties. Absolutely. So we're going to move on now to another section called the Prairie Gothic. And this, uh, the Prairie Gothic represents sort of the hardships and the trauma or tragedies and disasters in the prairie landscape. And so we're going to look at some more contemporary artists in the Prairie Gothic section. So this is a drawing by Ruth Cuthand. She's Plains Cree from uh, Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. She has a uh, master's degree in fine arts and she is uh, internationally known in her art. Um, most of what she's known for, what's made her really uh, well known in the arts community is she does some traditional beadwork and her some of her more famous pieces are beadwork of the smallpox virus, which is another metaphor of the virus that has wiped out so many First Nations in the past. Now, this is very different. This is a, a black and white drawing, so it's very stark, just like Adrian Stimson, so it's a nice contrast to that. And this is clearly a painting on the residential school system. She was a teacher, and she is representing the racism that has happened in the residential school system. Now, the residential school systems have happened for uh, over 150 years, and the last one closed down in 1996. So you can see here 
the teacher is holding a mug with a happy face on. So this is uh, representing the residential school s system, maybe in the 60s or 70s, or maybe even closer to the eight, 1980s or 90s. So the first thing that I see when I look at this is I see a lot of really pointy shapes. I see the teacher has a pointy nose. She's also got this uh, satirical grin on her face. She's got these really pointy shoes. She's got uh, a very pointy fingernail. There's this pointy witch cap, or maybe it's representing a dunce cap. And there's also the zigzag marks on the child's clothing. All of these triangular pointy shapes uh, represent aggression. So this is not uh, a mild passive drawing. This is one that's really showing the harsh realities of the uh, residential school system. I mean, you've got the lines on the blackboard, I will never be as good as. So this is clearly still the emotional abuse uh, and the, the um, trauma that has happened to these poor children. And then you see this, this child that looks a little bit doll-like, but there's some eraser marks. This yeah. is done in Chirka, and she's just erasing through the entire child as if they're trying to erase the Indian in the yeah, child. Absolutely. So this represents more, so much more than the need for discipline. Mm -hmm. And um, what could you say, Marissa, about this stark title at the top, Nobody Likes an Uppity Indian? I, uh, there's so many different things that I want to highlight in this one, and I'll quickly talk about that. But this here, um, I want to make point that um, I will never be as good as. Um, both both my parents are um, Indian residential school survivors, and this is actually something that they continue to deal with, um, that they're, they don't have that is something that they're still um, trying to heal from. And I, I love that Lynn pointed out the erasure of where the skin color would be um, and how that, that really is um, a metaphor for what these schools were to, to my people. Um, the title of this is called January Thaw, Edge of Town. And it references another time, another dark time for, for my people. And uh, it's talking about the uh, Saskatoon freezing deaths where the Saskatoon uh, police service would take indigenous men and leave them outside of the town, outside of the city in um, freezing temperatures, often with shoes and no clothes. And there are a couple men from my community, along with uh, my cousin, who, um, who suffered hypothermia and um, died. I would definitely encourage everybody to read the book, The Starlight Tours, and it talks about uh, my family in there. So I like that this one she really put so much pain in one piece. And, and I can feel that just looking at it. And as a person who is directly affected by residential schools, I'm so thankful that I don't have to see the face of the child and I don't have to see pain. Because when you see that, you just won't ever forget it. I appreciate that art always is healing, even when whatever you create might not be the prettiest thing to look at or, the, or bring up things that you don't want to remember or you don't want to see or be reminded of. And I'm, I love that art is healing in so many different forms that way. Nobody likes an uppity Indian. I feel like that's a reference to the, the part where the, the child would leave the school and has to fit into society. And what do you do? You don't know your culture. And this is the only thing that you know is this is what you're supposed to be. 
and I know for my dad, when he was done the school and he went home, he was disciplined even more there because he didn't know any of the any of the things that um, he he didn't remember any of the things that he knew when he left to the school, and so my Muslim was really upset with him. How do you not know? And also just my Muslim not understanding what these schools were really like. So for a child to, to be there, to, to have everything stripped away and, and to have, um, to have you know, these priests and these nuns tell you that what you are is bad, who you are is bad, your language, your song, your ceremony, everything is bad. And then you go home and you, you just don't know where you fit. So I talked to my mom and dad and that's the best fit they gave me for that. I'm so thankful to Ruth for creating something like this and to be able to have these conversations, even though they're tough and even though they're painful and even though that you know, there's survivors and there's people who are still living through a lot of the pain that you see here. Well, thank you, Marissa, for sharing that. I know that was not easy, mm -hmm. such a dark and heavy topic, and to know that it was so, hit so close to home. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate you sharing that. Thank you very much. And I like how you also mentioned that um, art is, um, Art isn't supposed to be pretty. I think we all think that art is always supposed to be something that's beautiful and lovely. Art is a message. Mm -hmm. it's, it's here to tell a story and it has a purpose beyond just looking pretty. This is not a pretty picture. There's nothing uh, pleasant about this and it, it, it's, it's meant to be difficult to look at, but it does draw you in because there's so much symbolism and there's so many messages in here and we can't forget them. And so it is interesting how you said that it is healing. It's not just healing for the artists, it's healing for the people who, who look at it. And it's healing for all of us as another way to learn these stories. And it's almost an easier way to break into these difficult stories because sometimes when we look at a piece of artwork, we can pick and choose the symbols that we want to focus on at that time. It, it can be really harsh or it can be a little bit less harsh. And I think those are really, really interesting things. There's a lot of, of messages in here. And the one that points out to me that's very, very soft right by the child's ear is there is a novel in here. And I think there's a lot of novels and stories in this piece that you could pick, pick on and share. Okay, we are going to move on to another um, section still in the Prairie Gothic, uh, also dark. We're going to be looking at an artist named Alan Benjamin Clark and his representation of uh, the industrial school system. Now, these two paintings here by Alan Benjamin Clark, he is a uh, Muscogee First Nations from Saskatchewan, and he is also a trained artist. He has studied uh, fine arts at the University of Regina. Now, his work is much more colorful, but very harsh color and very hard to look at. So he says humor is what keeps him sane. And he has a very dark humor in these two paintings. He works with visual puns. So first of all, you look at these very stark, really difficult to look at paintings. And the one on the top is called Sins of Our Father. And the one at the bottom is called Mother Soup Superior. So um, there's the, a visual pun and play on words. So the mother superior is the one that's giving the soup uh, with uh, holding the, the soup pot and the ladle and the, the boy here who is clearly emaciated and starving and chained up and is hungry and wanting more soup. Um, it's, uh, it's really hard to look at. And so he's had that pun on soup. It's got harsh lighting, really bold, harsh colors. I mean, the the nun herself is, you know, she's very bold. She's full figured. He's tiny. She's got this blank stare on her face, um, whether they're glasses or just 
like no eyes, almost like inhuman. And then you look at the, the priest up above. He also has this very huge figure, black, bold, and he almost has a demonic expression on his face. And then below, it's he's, you know, getting ready to... Um, you know, give this poor child a beating and the child's jacket says all saints. So it speaks a lot of uh, the irony and the, the darkness of the um, uh, all the Christian religions who were the ones leading the residential school system. And the look on horror of the child's face is really, really hard to take. Now, the other thing that I wanted to mention from an artistic perspective is it's no accident, it's very intentional that Alan Benjamin Clark painted these in a diamond shape. So a diamond represents danger. And both of these paintings are very close up and cropped. Like you can see that the nun's head is cropped. It's, it's very close up view of what's happening. And the one up top, it's, it's almost like I feel like I'm looking through some kind of porthole and I'm seeing something that I'm not supposed to see. I really get that feeling. There's something that we're not supposed to see here, but it's this viewpoint, this snapshot, and it's definitely in a composition that represents danger. Mm -hmm. I, when I can, I when I hear my parents' stories, um, this really is what I imagine. The same thing: this demonic figures and these women and men who really were not born with the compassion gene or didn't carry, um, you know, just, I can never articulate the words that make sense for something like this. One of the things that I see is how these older men have their backs against that, like they're sort of ignoring or, you know, out of sight, out of mind, I don't know. Um, this is so real and raw, the, the, the patches of blood on the body of the child, how he's gravely thin, he's lacking his hair, his braids, how he's chained to the building, and uh, I'm actually even surprised there's food in there. I, I know that um, from the accounts of my parents that that was something they didn't get off of. can't really speak on it. Um, I think you, you mentioned a good point, Marissa. It's, it's almost like, how could these religious people treat them this way? And I think the only way in my mind that somebody could do something like this to another human being is that they don't see them as a human being, is that somehow they, they see them and believe that they are less than. And it's a, a very, very... Um, they're very hard paintings to look at. Okay. And then again, just what you said, that this is healing for people. And uh, that art isn't always pretty. And I just love that you're still able to tell your truth no matter how pretty or how dark it is. Mm -hmm. They are very, very stark paintings. We will just move right over here to the very last uh, artist, Sherry. Farrell Rosset. She is Métis and from the Temiskaming First Nations uh, community in Quebec. She is a trained artist. She's got a master's uh, degree in arts and a bachelor degree in education and she's an illustrator. And you will notice here that her style is very different from all the other art that we looked at. This uh, triptych is called um, Riel's Vision of Death, 1885. So sh this is a story, a narrative of the um, Louis Riel and the story of him being tried for treason in 1885. Uh, he is the leader of the Northwest uh, Rebellion and trying to help the Métis people through, um, through that part in history. So in the first part of the uh, triptych at the beginning, I mean, you will see that these are quite colorful, and then there's a, there's script in each one of them. So what Sherry Farrell Sherry Farrell Reset did 
is she went through Louis Riel's diary and she started writing experts, excerpts out of each of them. So this is, this is actually his own words from his diary. And I'll read some um, parts of it in a minute. So you can only imagine what it would be like spending the last 30 days of your life in a cell in a prison waiting out your death sentence. And so there is a representative of uh, Louis Riel in his, in his prison cell. And it's evening and it's sunset. And I think that's uh, very metaphorical for the end of a journey, the end of a life. And in front, we have this female figure on a horse, and there's an empty horse beside him. And really, he's representing death. She represents death. So he says here, death hovers over me like a great bird flying over a chicken, which it wants to carry off. Death keeps guard at the door of my cell. Death peers at me behind my prison bars. Death watches at my door like a Labrador, Labrador retriever, keeping watch in front of the house. So here she is waiting for him and the other horse is for him. And um, I just think it's, it's kind of a beautiful um, image of death. I mean, we always think of death as the Grim Reaper, as something to be scared of, to be horrified by, but here it's, it's something much more positive and beautiful than that. And it's almost like um, it's a celebration. There's some flowers and, and everything in the, in the hair. I also noticed the Métis infinity symbol throughout here. So she adds all these little um, symbolism through her, her um, triptych as well. Mm -hmm. And the ribbon in her hair, those are also like a, a thing that we, that Federal ribbons and tying ribbon and that, that's also a part of a ceremony that that indigenous people use quite often. Just tying cloth or a ribbon. So I love that she incorporated that in there. The second panel, um, at first I was a little bit confused by it because here I'm thinking, how does he refer to death? And here's this woman sitting on a bed and it looks a little bit more um, seductive. But here he's saying, death reveals how much she is attached to me. She speaks affectionately to me saying, I am your wife. I don't want to turn my back on you. You'll never hear me say I'm leaving you. I follow faithfully wherever you go. I am always trying to embrace you for I love you. So here again, he's representing or she's representing death as his wife, something that's um, uh, a lifelong relationship. And um, I think that's quite a beautiful way of looking at it. So through his journal writings, he's starting out at the beginning, trying to, you know, the fear of death and trying to accept where, where, where he's going. This panel, he's coming to more acceptance of the death. And then the very last one, he's coming to a sense of um, forgiveness. So here he's saying, death among those whom God lets you carry off each day, how many are, are you on, how many are on their guard? Blessed be the judge who told me, I have set the day for your death. Now you know it. I am warning you, get ready, make use of the time I am giving you. Blessed be the six jurymen who recommended me to the mercy of the court. So here he's accepted his fate. He's accepted that he's going to be hanging for treason. And not only, instead of being angry and bitter about that, he's making the most of whatever time he has left to appreciate life, to see it as a blessing. And he's forgiving the jurymen who have sent him to treason. And I think that's just um, that's a, that's uh, incredible a, yeah. journey in 30 days. That's beautiful. And can you speak on uh, the candlelight and the final picture, Marissa? Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that I love about this one is the cheekbones and how Indigenous women, that's, that's one of our common, common traits is those high cheekbones. And I, I, that was one of the first things that I noticed when I was looking at this. I love that he references... Um, this is love, that this is a, a partnership and, and that, that she's coming and, and it, that's uh, when we pass, we, we go to our final camp and that's a, a good place and that's a, the, that's a the place. And in Cree language, um, the word female comes from the root, <clears throat> the root word uh, that translates to the word son. So, and and I love that 
it's almost like she's sort of beating him with the light into the light, right? And, uh, so that was that was one of the the most beautiful things I liked about about this. So I find that this is um, a, a perfect way to end this tour is uh, on a note of forgiveness. So we've walked you through the entire um, exhibition and we started out on a memory and honoring the land and then looking at historical events and then the repercussions of the signing of the treaties, uh, Curry Gothic and all the, the trauma of the residential school system. And I think this is just lovely. It's a, it's a beautiful triptych, it's colorful, it's very much um, about storytelling, which in the First Nations people, it was oral storytelling. And now we're ending looking at art as visual storytelling, another way to look at our history and the Indigenous people's history. So it's a lovely way to wrap it up. Do you have any final uh, um, One thing when we researching uh, the artists is that the majority of them, I don't know about the, this artist, um, Sherry, 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 uh, that each of them were um, Indian residential school survivors and how uh, the common theme there was the, that art is healing and it's, it's a universal love language and um, some of the artists, I've, I've done it backward in comparison to them. Uh, where I created things that really meant something to me the way that they weren't really supposed to or so their art really wasn't celebrated because the truth was too much and I've been so lucky to have them come before me to really make that path easier and my artwork now is is the things that I love and the things that I'm able to celebrate now things that they were not able to celebrate and I'm so thankful for artists who continue to break barriers and who continue to tell the stories of their people um, so thank you so much for having me and walking uh, through through these pieces with me. And Lynn, I so appreciate our partnership every time. Thank, thank you, Marissa. I appreciate our partnership and I learn so much from you every time we have these, uh, these tours and we are so grateful and blessed to have you in our community. So I'm going to sign off and I just want to let you know that there is one more um, there's a few more mini tours coming up on the Prairie Vernacular. The next one is going to be on June 26th with Joanne Grunberg, and she's going to be speaking more on Prairie Gothic. So I hope you join us for those. And for today, thank you very much for joining us. We greatly appreciate you signing on and seeing our virtual tours. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.